Hello, legends and super legends. Welcome to Velo Harmony Live. We've had an unusual Wednesday here in Central Texas. We got a cool front yesterday. It was 68 degrees Fahrenheit this morning. I've lived in this area for more than three decades. I've never seen that happen in July. So those people who don't believe in climate change, it's upon us. And tomorrow is going to be 67 in the morning. These are winter temperatures or even spring. We don't get them. And we've had a lot of rain this year. So, yeah, climate change is here. With all the fires in California and the different things, the earthquakes, like they have repeated earthquakes, which they've never had, like back-to-back -back heavy earthquakes earlier. So it's happening. Welcome, everybody. Let's see here. Who do we have? Jeffrey Davis, super legend. Glad to see you here. I was uh, speaking with uh, one of our super legends, uh, Psycho Warrior. He's not here yet, but uh, he's one of the people that bought one of our training plans. And he's also gotten a threshold test and other things from the website. And he had a bunch of questions, and I told him, compile the questions and send them to me. He hasn't because the, the, the plans are pretty clear. I put a lot of time into putting details in there. But I got a text from him today that said that he was riding down the road, got to a turn circle, and it was a car coming in the turn circle. And without even trying very hard, he accelerated to like 115, you know, RPMs, which is something, you know, he'd never do before because of the workouts in there, the leg speed workout, whatever. But what he said was that it is so nice to know. He said, now I get it. Once you do something in training, you believe in your mind and so it, it removes the limitation. So we went, the banter was back and forth, but it was really good to get that feedback because that's what other people miss out on. You don't have to be a racer to train. That's what I mean when I say we, we train, we don't ride. Whatever event you're going to do, you have to prepare yourself so that when, when you're out there, you know there's no limitation in what you can do, whatever cadence you want to hit or whatever. You're ready. So he, he's all excited. So that was kind of good. Hey, Robert. Welcome, Robert Tangler here. Another super legend. I want to thank all you guys last week, all of you super chatters. That was really, really neat. You know, it was nice to see people help me out of the channel. It means a lot. Appreciate that. All right, let's get going here. Who do we have here? Adam Mills. Today I train on my old wheels and tires. $150 total. I got the same average and even some PRs than on my $1,800 dura ace wheel with tubeless setup. <clears throat> well, all of that, there's too many variables, too. It's not just the wheels. It depends on the conditions today. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. There, there is a difference in the expensive wheels and the least expensive wheels. Uh, training on heavy wheels are good because they're durable and, you know, it's just training miles. They don't mean anything. But there is a difference when you put on faster wheels on your bike. Paul Longa just got here. Hey, man. Welcome. Tom Nix. Let's see here. Greetings to everybody from Austria. Austria. Every time I, I see the name Austria, I think about the sound of music. When I was a kid, I watched it a tremendous amount of times. I really liked it. I liked the songs and everything about the movie. It was, I think, what's her name? Julie Andrews, Christopher Plummer. You know, so it's like beautiful countryside. It's just, it's just beautiful. You know, that's something I get when I watch the tour now. I look at the countryside. I like that NBC uh, Bob Roll and Paul Liggett, Phil Liggett talk about the churches and the different buildings that have been kept up or restored or whatever. I really like that because I like that the Europeans preserve their old stuff as opposed to tearing it down and building new. So it's really nice to see that. <clears throat> so I want to share with you that I am happy. So Tom Nix from Austria says he wants to share he's happy. The reason? I have holiday and a made 698.1 kilometers, 24 hours race last weekend. Excellent. Wow. That's a lot of kilometers, 698 kilometers. Good for you. So he got some time off and put some caves in. That's the way to do it. We did ours in December. Paul Ilunga took off like six weeks, and we did the Rafa Festive 500. We were just piling on the case. Most of the month of December, we're out there. So it's like, uh, that's great. I mean, um, I think that whenever you can't get out there, go on a ride. 
you know. Hey, Robert, thanks. Go on a ride. I just talked about you, Psycho. I just told him about your text today about the, the effect of the training and how you, you have more snap when you need to, you know, and that's what we use, man. I'm, I, the same thing you described. Every time I'm going through and a car comes around to where the situation is right, I accelerate. They don't expect it. And you can get some speed, you know, accelerate and get in a draft of a car and sit there for a while. It takes snap to do that. So that was cool to read. I was just telling the folks on here when I opened up. <clears throat> so Tom Nick said that he had holiday and he put in extra case, 698 kilometers. That's awesome. I mean, I, that's, that's some serious time on the bike. <clears throat> So Chris Barron says, talking to a guy who works for a world tour team, the frames you see on the tour are not the same frames you buy from your local bike shop. They are pro-specific. The F2 affiliate is a moot point. That's scary. What, they're making crappy frames for the pros? <laughs> you know? And so what, what, you know, what are they doing? I don't buy that. That's, that's weird. There's no way. I mean, I understand that the pros get special geometry and all of that they don't tell us about, but if the, that's their biggest marketing spectacle, you know, I, I, you know, I've owned a carbon frame and I just wanted people to know you're going to buy that stuff. You better make sure it's insured because they, they break, you know, steel frames don't break. They'll bend at the tensile limit. Carbon breaks, not just the frame, the bars. I've had carbon's bar cause me to crash. Didn't even know what was going on. It just catastrophic failure is very common with carbon. And you guys have seen it. I put a video here couple maybe a year or so ago the guy just riding a time trial by the wheel just crumpled and it looked like he went over a manhole cover he didn't hit anybody so yeah so those kind of things are pretty dangerous actually if, from what i'm reading here that's what he told you so that means they don't give a crap about those riders those guys are those guys are doing more than we will ever do their frame should be tougher than the one they're selling so if theirs are breaking like that what does that mean because those guys push those frames to the limit most people don't ride as like those guys do. So I don't know what that comment meant, but I'll take that with a grain of salt because the, the manufacturers use those guys as tests. You remember they had the Cervelo test team. That's another reason their bikes are very popular. The Cervelo test team, when Cervelo was a young company, rode those bikes out there. What I personally like about the Cervelo frames are the angles and the length of the top tube. They, they ha they're easy to fit. They have more reasonable stuff. Not that the other guys are too crazy, but, um, you know, the frame needs to be durable. And that's the reason the UCI has a limit on the weight. That's one, one reason they have a limit. Can you imagine what would happen if there was no weight limit? Those guys would be riding on paper frames. And you need some kind of weight on your frame. So don't get too crazy about super light stuff. Like there are people, you know, we used to call uh, weight weenies that would drill holes in in bolts and chain rings and different things, at some point, they get more fragile, taking out a tenth of a gram here and there. So you need some kind of weight on the bike under you. And that's why the UCI, I think they kept it around 16 pounds or so. Don't quote me on that. I don't know what it is today. But there is a limit for that reason, for safety. And in fact, what ends up happening is the frames are still pretty light. The pros actually add weight to their frames today. They put other things on there that basically to give it more weight because even after they build it up, some of them can be under the limit and they'll put heavier components or other things on there. So they, you know, they they need to if if it if his comment indicates that they're sending lesser stuff for the to the guys, it, that I don't I don't I don't buy that. Because those guys, I, I think as a manufacturer, I'd give them the frame so they can test it so I can go back and say, okay, why did this break? Let, let's strengthen here, let's strengthen that before you put it on the market. So, yeah, I understand he's probably right that what they're selling are different. I hope it's different in terms of geometry, the available sizes, and yada, 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 because those pros, the pros that are in the know, they are very particular about their fit. And I think I've mentioned here that they did a tour of the Sky when Sky was still not in yours. They did a tour of their bus. And there was a 121 millimeter stem. I mean, think about it. 
121 millimeter stem. That's how particular those guys are. So anybody going for a stem that they want that extra millimeters about a human hair, you know they're particular about the frame. So I don't know. I'll take that with a grain of salt. You know, they they are they are testing the stuff and it gives them the ability to do research and then put frames on the market. Generally, that's what that that's the process. It should be anyway. But uh, yeah, whatever happens in that frame happened. It's hard. But the point I was making was that carbon, I've said it before, carbon is, when it reaches its limit, it snaps. That's just what happens. And it, it doesn't have to, you know, you've seen a lot of crashes. A lot of those crashes, the guys' frames are broken. They're standing by the side of the road waiting. That's not a one-off. They break under those guys. So if that means that they're sending lesser quality to those pros, I, I, I don't know. That would be kind of. That would that would be highly suspicious. I doubt that because those guys are particular, and you know they're making a living. They're not going to ride just any kind of thing. So yeah, uh, let's see who we have here. Migundu twelve. He said, "What's your opinion on moving from one seventy two five to one sixty five after getting a bike fit?" I'm not sure why you'd come to ask me if you got a bike fit. You should have asked your fitter. Because your fitter should determine that while fitting you. I've answered this question for somebody else before, and I told them the same thing. So ask your fitter, because the fitter should, you should have a reason. Why are you going from 172 to 165? Did the fitter recommend it? Are you having a problem? Only do things when there's a problem you're trying to correct. Otherwise, just use what's on there. It's not that big a deal. 165 is for a very small person. A lot of lady cyclists use 165, or very small guys. That's the reason they decided to put 172 fives on most frames when they ship. Because it's a good, for average build people, it's a good length of crank. When you start getting into special applications, there needs to be a reason. So if you've already had a fit, did, did, did the fitter recommend that? And if the fitter recommended it, that this question is for the fitter. Why? What problem are you trying to fix? Because the body can get used to a lot of different things and cranks being one of them. You know, so just be cautious. You know, there needs to be a good reason. So you're saying here, my fitter was telling me this would reduce my hip angle, making it easier to ride in the drops. That's bogus. <laughs> you know. The body does not care. I've ridden 180 millimeter cranks. I adjusted my saddle height appropriately and my fore aft, and you're fine. Your hips roll when you get in the drops. You don't need to change your hip angle to ride in the drops. Just set the saddle correctly. Set the fore aft. So, no, I don't buy that. I don't agree with that. So, let him pay for the cranks for you. How's that? Let him buy the, the 165 because they cost. Let him buy it since it's a big deal. Because if, if you can't ride 172.5 because you need 165 just to reduce your hip angle, that means your fit's off. You should be able to do that unless you're just a very small person and then your body requires that. So that's that's all I can say because I don't have enough information on you. But just be cautious with changing things. You end up creating more problems. I did a fit online with somebody who neglected to tell me they had inserts in their shoes and yada 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 and after the fit was done later on started saying the foot was going numb and whatever and then later on through multiple emails admitted that the prior fitter had put inserts in the shoes so i asked why oh i don't know why so my question to him well you paid for those wedges How, why would you not ask why the, the fitter is not just going to put stuff in your shoes and not explain it so it was just kind of weird. So I told him my suggestion would be remove everything they put in there and just use the shoe. Because the only reason for putting wedges is to correct the problem. And how exactly do you not remember why the fitter did that? Plus they charge you for more. So that's a non-standard fit. So that was kind of weird. So yeah, when you start getting special things done, it's because you're trying to correct an issue. So if you're saying it's going to improve your hip angle when you're having problem riding the drops before, they should be able to correct that with regular size cranks. You can ride long crank as long as possible. You know, I've ridden 180. This, the setup of your saddle has to be adjusted and moved. So I don't know. 
I'm not going to say much because I don't have enough facts. Just your comment back there. So I just err on the side of only changing what is absolutely necessary. And one thing about the position on the bicycle, it is better to make little changes, see the effect, than making many changes at once. Because then you will have no idea what's going on. You need to make small changes. Small changes make big differences when you're close. When you know you get set up and then you make little changes to correct some discomfort or some ergonomic need you have. So it sounds like there's a lot missing in your comment there. So I can't really give you an advice that you can use unless I have, if I had done a workup on you, then we'll get a better idea. Asborn here, Asborn sent me um, at the at the uh, premiere. He gave me some coffee money, money. So I want you to know that I actually bought hot chocolate, Asborn, with that money. I really appreciate that because um, I don't do coffee, you know. So I did hot chocolate. So that was kind of cool. He said that since I'm buying all this kit, he has some coffee money. But uh, the the kit that I, the kids that I get. You guys know I do my best to try to get them on sale where possible. And the, the jersey that I got from La Passion, the, the, the one I wore in the last ride, part of it was I got a discount from them because of goodwill, because my issues with the orange jersey like it that I had, even though I was partially at fault. And so I got it at a reduced price. And it's the same thing with Rafa because I'm in the bike industry. I get things from Rafa at a discount. I still have to buy them, but I get them at a discount. The channel has reached the point where, as I've said before, there's a lot of people sending emails on YouTube. In the about section, there's an email that you can put there. And people are sending stuff. They want to send me stuff. And what I usually do is I say, send me the link. Let me see the product before I tell them to send it. Because it needs to be things that make sense that I think you all will be interested in because there's a lot of manufacturers from Asia and other places that copy. There's some company that makes Jersey look just like Rafa, but you can tell it's not Rafa. It's just like they sent the link and I told them, I said, why don't you just brand it differently? Because they were actually using the name Rafa. I said, I don't want that foolishness. I don't encourage companies that just steal other people's ideas. They need to come up with their own. You know, you got La Passion, they got their own design. You got Castelli, you got Rafa, you got other people. Why should these guys in China feel that they can just copy La Passion or copy Rafa, make it look just like it, then sell it at a low price? You know, you guys know, I think there's a place called Alibaba, other places that have that. So I don't deal with those vendors. I just don't, I don't encourage this, this stuff because their government doesn't crack down on that. The same thing with movies, you know, people make the joke that, you know, a lot of the movies that go overseas, people don't buy them because they copy the, the, the movies and it, it hurts the industry. I mean, that intellectual property, somebody came up with an idea and you you just get to copy it. So, no. So get a, I get a lot of that and I just have to sift through. I end up doing a lot of blocking because some of them, the, the English is not very good. And when you tell them you're not interested, they keep sending more emails. And so I end up blocking. But there are a few things coming. There is one guy who's supposed to send a bike holder for, for mountain bikes in your garage to where you can store your bikes vertically on the wall. I told him, send it. I'll check it out. And then there's another guy that's uh, going to send uh, another product that I think will be useful to the channel. Some of them play games to where they'll send you the link and say they want you to test something. And when you say you're interested, they say, oh, you need to buy it. So I asked this one guy, why would I buy your product to test? If I'm going to buy a product, it needs to be something I want to use. I'm not going to buy a product to test and advertise it for you. So I don't know where what marketing school they went to, but they put in a lot of effort, but they're not working very smart. And that's the reason why the companies on the, on the the in the West are the ones that are running the ad agencies and whatever, because they have true marketing experts that know. They have marketing packages. So a lot of it is a waste of time, but it's getting to where we'll be getting more products. But I'm only going to bring quality stuff. And that's what this is about so that we can get more exposure. I don't want to just do Rafa stuff. You know, La Passion has a lot of good colors. I've been looking at their stuff. But as we all know, even on their site, the reviews that are there, the buyers are complaining about the return policy that I've mentioned. There are buyers in the UK that were paying like, I think, 30 
out of 15 or 30 pounds to return, no, 30 euros to return the jersey. And the guy was, ups was upset because he said the fit was off. It was too small according to the sizing chart when he got it. So he wanted to send it back to get another size. You can't do an exchange with them. You have to return it. Then they say you have to make sure the tag is still attached and all of that. So there's a lot of little, if there's a little scuff on it or whatever, we're not going to accept it. Too many conditional things. So, so a lot of the, the, the buyers are ending up keeping the La Pasión stuff because it's costly to return it. And so they're making their views clear on their website that I'm keeping it, but I'm not happy, you know, and that kind of stuff. And then the internal people will reply to some of those unhappy reviews, you know. But they need to, if you're going to talk about the, the, the other guys on your site, then maybe all the money you're saving from sponsorship and everything else, give us a decent return policy like the other guys. Because the other guys are paying for all the sponsorship and other things and still giving us good return policy. So that's the kind of stuff. But they, they do have some, I like their colors. That's the biggest thing. I think that's something that Rafa needs to look at because there's a guy here named Stefano Mancini. That's his issue. He's an Italian guy. He said, Rafa just got too many blacks and whites. They need other stuff. They've had that in the past. I got some old jerseys. I think I got an old one I would wear in the near future, old lime green. They got, they've had some nice colors, but then they, lately it's getting a little mundane. They need to get a little crazy. They need an Italian guy in the de design department. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Let's see here. Uh, <laughs> so as uh, as born, I hope I'm pronouncing that. There was a guy, a cycling, now tennis champion named Bjorn Borg, and his name was spelled with a B J, to where the J was silent. I think it's as born. I hope I'm I'm close. He said, "I need to lose some belly before I put my bike on the diet." <laughs> ah. <laughs> Uh, just ride your bike, man. That belly will fall off. Just ride every day, even if it's 30 minutes. Go out. I know you guys, and, and, and you're in Norway, so your summer's short. It's going to be getting cold. You know, you know they, they have cold weather for, for a long time. I think that it thaws out probably in late May or something like that. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> Let's see here. Jeffrey said, I'm still at work. I hope everyone has a great week. Thanks, Jeffrey. <laughs> so Asborn said, hey, Jeffrey, thanks for the super chat. Appreciate it. Um, Jeffrey, you need to start. You need to get back on the bike. I haven't seen anything from you. We need to talk. Send me a note or something. Jeffrey's one of the guys that I coach, and uh, he's been busy with work, all the other stuff. So his training's kind of. Just get out when you can or put on the trainer. Just, just keep your legs turning. There was a video from Chris Froome on Twitter. Twitter puts it in my feed because I guess they look at what you're interested in because I, I don't follow him on Twitter. But he, he has a short clip where he's, he's probably home now. He's from the hospital. And he's got one leg on uh, the, the, the good leg that wasn't hurt. I think the right leg wasn't hurt. He's got it on something, and he removed the pedal from the bike so that he wouldn't be tempted to put his foot in. But he's doing one-legged riding indoors. And he's, he just put the caption said, you know, working hard or something like that, and then he smiled. But he's basically working that leg because he had a lot of uh, – I think he had fractures. So he's working to build that leg. So he's doing one-legged pedaling, you know. So these guys – it was good that he put that on there because a lot of times these guys crash. You don't see them. Now all of a sudden they come back and they're riding hard and you miss that gap in between. So he's doing that for his followers because he's got like a Froomey fan club, they call it. And that's what that was on. But it was good to see that he's back on the bike, on the trainer, and just pedaling that leg. But they removed the pedal from the right side so he could do one-legged pedaling and he had his foot, the right foot sitting on a little pad <laughs> that they raised up for him. So to build a strength back in the leg. Cycling is a good rehab tool. Those of you who've ever been through some kind of surgery or been hurt in the rehab centers and not the fancy bikes, but they use like a, a grommet or something. They use the cycling motion to really rehab because there's no pounding. So that's kind of, you know, so it's a good sport for, that you can do for life. 
unlike running, running is very hard on the connective tissues. You know, um, you know, I used to do track, so I know that it affects everybody differently. So cycling is a good sport to get into. The only thing you need some kind of metric because you can cheat. <laughs> you guys know that. All right, let's see here. Chris Barron said, uh, I mentioned before, he said he worked for a, super, a world super bike team, motorbikes. They're supposed to be the same as sold to the public, but they're not. Yeah. I, and the same thing with cars and other things. They, they do put some additional custom stuff. And theoretically, they're supposed to learn from that and then bring stuff to the public. So, yeah, I agree. My my my, my comments, I, I don't want it to be misconstrued. I'm not anti-carbon. I just wanted people to know my bikes are insured. They're tied to the homeowner's policy on the house. One is titanium, one is steel, two of them steel, and they got carbon fork. I didn't do it because they're steel or whatever. It's our bikes are pricey. We go to these stores, somebody asks, you know, who watches your bike when you stop? Anything can happen to your bike. Forget about whether it crashes or split. You got a fifteen thousand dollar bike or eight thousand dollar bike or four thousand dollar bike, and you lean it against the wall to go get something to drink. One day you're on a ride, and you come back, and it's gone. If you have that homeowner's policy, you're not out eight thousand or four thousand or whatever. It's just good to have. And the reason I mention is a lot of cyclists don't have that because they just are not aware or don't look into that. And it's really easy to get it. It's not very expensive. So that, that was my reasoning for bringing it in. And the second thing was to let people know, if you have a carbon bike, don't treat it like a dump truck. You got to baby them. You know, there are riders that don't like for their bike to fall. Paulie Longat knows when we used to ride with UMC, there was one guy, I'm not going to call his name. We we're standing at the, at the store and he just carelessly leaned the bike and he starts to walk into the store and the bike just crashes. It was as if to say somebody had dropped a kid, like a baby in a a stroller or, you know, that that's how I reacted. Like, ah, you know, cause that's, that's the way I am about my bikes. But you know how it is. Your bike falls. The first thing, the, 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 the hoods are off or some, something's been knocked. To, you know, that's how we are. We don't like our bikes to fall. And this particular guy didn't blink. His attitude was like really odd because he did not even turn around to go get the bike. He walked into the store and left the bike. Paul knows who I'm talking about. You know, and and I was like, you got to be kidding me. No way. That The first thing, you know, you guys know you crash and you're not seriously hurt. What's the first thing? H how's my bike? <laughs> and so that was unusual to see another guy riding the bike. So not everybody's as particular, you know. But no, I don't like for my bike to fall. So when I'm placing it, I put the saddle, handlebars, tire, touching something. So I got three touch points. So if somebody bumps it, you still got other things holding it. So, yeah, treat your bike. Take care of your bike. It will take care of you. That, that was what that was about. So, yeah, uh, he's right. They're not going to make the exact things for the pro that they bring to the to the market. We're, we're hoping a lot of it is testing. They learn and then they beef things up. Or certain things that they make for the pros are not necessary for the public. They might do custom stuff for just the pros that need that application, and they don't really, especially in cars. There's just certain things they put in there they're not going to bring, you know, because you're not at that level per se every day. So yeah, so it's not going to be exactly the same. But they, they learn from those applications and then they bring it to the market. That so he's right. And another thing he mentioned there, he says Specialized has never made a frame. They are a marketing company. Giant makes the frame. Yeah, but we're hoping. I know Specialized has somebody that's put giving an input. My issue with the Specialized frame, like I did the video here, I couldn't fit them. In my size, their their the seat angles are too aggressive. I, I need a shallow seat angle for me. I'd have to ride a very large frame to get a decent seat angle in the Specialized, and it's, I shouldn't have to. I, I ride a 56, 55 thereabouts. My orange bike is a 55, it was custom. But generally a 56 will fit me. So a lot of those other bikes, I'd have to get a 58 or a 59. You know, I don't need that much just to get a decent top tube length because I need at least 58 and a, and a half or more in the top tube to not have an overly long, long stem. That's what I talk about bike sizing. Once you learn those things that you get to know, oh, okay, this, you know, Cannondale has really good sizing. I like the way they do their bikes. The top tubes are nice and long, you know, so for, for reasonably sized frames. 
So you shouldn't have to go to a large frame just to get the length you need if you have long arms. And that's what they do with these fewer sizes they're making nowadays. They're not making the one centimeter increments like they used to. It's not practical for them, I guess. But don't talk yourself out of getting a custom frame because you can. And I think Calfee does carbon custom. There are people. It, it's not that much more expensive. Unless, you know, unless you're trying to buy all the fancy group rows and all. That's why they get their markup when you buy a full bike. If you're just getting the, the frame set, it's very competitive. You just need to make sure you get, you get your measurements right. So, yeah. You don't buy a bike every day. So when you do it, invest the time and energy and make sure you're getting the right size. Because with a great frame, you can do wonders with it. You know, you can ride it for many years, strip it down, paint it like you got a new frame and go with, go with that. So there's a lot you can do. The frame is the foundation. That's why when people start talking about discs or regular, I said it just breaks. Spend your energy on the frame. Make sure that fits you. All the other stuff. You know, of course, if you're going to do discs, then you got to at the right time, let them know so they can have a frame that's engineered to handle discs, especially now that it's it's an option. So let's see here. Uh, Jeffrey Davis says, I'm not sure if it's normal, but I've had to. You've had to see in my saddle. Up. Uh, and I lose, and I lose weight. I'm not following you here. Side effect of a thinning posterior. Hmm. I'm not sure what you mean. You shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the width, the, the width of your hip bones are not going to change because you lose weight. And that's what that saddle that when you, if you got the right saddle for your hip width, that should not change because you sit on those two bones. If you look at our website, I've got the, you know, the medical thing there where you can see the human hip. Your width, your hip width will not change. There are other things that you lose. In fact, like if you lo lose a belly, you will get more error or you may want your bars a little further out or something as your flexibility improves. But as far as the width of the saddle, unless you started with the wrong width, it's not because you're losing weight. But as you ride more, yes, it is common to revisit your fit if your body has changed, but not the width of your saddle. So what that tells me is you may have had a saddle that was too big for you anyway, and it may have felt comfortable at first. And then you started to ride more. You felt like you needed something else. But the key is that if the new one feels better, then, you know, stay with that. Tim Lancaster. Lancaster says, thanks for all you experience, your experience and thought. I always thought a tie bike was solid investment and option. I mean, they're, they're all good. Don't get me wrong. If, if, if Right now, I don't have the budget for another bike. But if I were to get a bike, a, a fourth bike, it would be carbon. There's nothing wrong with them. I'm going to reiterate. Just like the jersey I made the thing, I messed up the orange one because I treated it like a bull in a candy store or a bull in a china shop. And then uh, the, 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 the cyan one now, I hand washed it. No worries. Okay. So you get a carbon bike, just take care of it. Don't, don't, don't just beat it up. Don't bang it on stuff. You know, if you have a fall on your carbon bike, find a place or a shop that can do the ultrasound and look at the frame to make sure there's no fracture if you don't see anything. Because that's what's recommended. And I think they need to put that on every sale document. That's what the, the carbon, the experts recommend. That if you have a good enough crash in a carbon frame, even if it looks okay, get it inspected. And they use ultrasound equipment to make sure there's nothing going on. So you're not surprised. Other than that, they're, they're not like chicken eggs, but the, the point is that when they reach their limit, they pop, you know, when, when steel reaches the limit, it will bend, you know, so you can still get home or whatever. That, that's what I mean. But what's going to cause it to reach the limit? I mean, you have to really do a tremendous amount of stuff. Who knows what kind of forces were going on in that race when that, when that frame snapped? Some, some people mentioned that it was a car that ran over. I didn't see one when I watched the clip because I actually saw it happen. It could have been. I don't know. But it, it doesn't really matter what causes it. Just keep in mind that they require a little more care, you know, 
And and most people that have bikes, whether they're carbon or steel or whatever, baby their we baby our bikes. We don't we don't treat our bikes poorly. Not just because it's steel. I mean, the biggest thing is that every time your bike falls, something gets out of whack. Out of your saddle will move because the saddle is a circular tube. And when it has enough force on it, which is good, it won't break. It turns within the tube, which is good. That's why you see after a crash, first thing the riders do, they're trying to adjust the bars or straighten the saddle or whatever. The saddle hits the ground. But and you know how we are. We don't want any scuffs on our saddle. People hate that when you crash, you know, even on your pedal. You're like, man, you know, so because of that, people take care of the stuff generally. And I just wanted people to know that even more so with carbon, you got to be a little more delicate. You can't bang it around or throw it in the back of the Jeep or whatever. <laughs> you know? And that's why I use the, the excuse of the, the, the example of the guy at the store. His bike fell and he just walked in the store like it was nothing. And I was like, man, no. So, no, they're they're fine. Just just take care of them, you know, uh, and, and you'll be good. They, they last. The, the stuff that we see on TV I don't know. Maybe they're just doing because those guys change frames a lot. You know, they don't they don't they don't keep them too long. A lot of the pros sometimes would give frames away. When I used to race, we'd get frames. I always had certain frames that fit me better than others. The ones that would fit me better, I would keep the other ones. I gave them away, friends and family, because you're getting another one. And who doesn't want the new stuff? At some point, you know, then sometimes you compromise. You get a frame. You'll see some of the guys in the tour. The seat pins, uh, you know, we we'll call it seat pin, but it's really the seat posts. Some of the seat posts are so high, and I'm like, man. And you and you look at them, and they got this big gap between where their body is and where the top tube is. I'm like, yeah, they're catching a lot of wind, and their arms are straight. We were talking about it with uh, when we rode with Jerry last Saturday. I mentioned it. Uh, I don't like my my frame to be too small. I, I like it right there, even with the new geometry because they're using the stack height and so forth. You should still, be, it, the saddle should be reasonable. And the funny thing is you look at the top guys like Thomas, Sagan, all of them, you don't see that. That It's always some of the unknown riders. I think they're just they're playing around, you know, because the, the you can't reinvent position. You know, it's just, uh, you can get a smaller frame, but it's going to feel a little twitchy. Some, you know, some people say, ah, oh, it's a little lighter, it's a little stiffer. Yeah, but it comes with other issues. Get the frame for your body size and you'll be good. You can steer with your hip better, you know, so. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big investment. So when you do it, take the time. Be sized and purchase so you're done. You don't want to be buying them all the time. Um, top bikes that say, oh, titanium doesn't rust. Nowadays, you know, the new steel that they treat, they don't rust either. But I think you get a good carbon bike. It will last you a long time as well. You just, just take care of it. Paul says, UMC guys, I miss their crazy <laughs> craziness sometimes. I don't miss them. Those, <laughs> those guys. <laughs> I miss Bob. Bob was Bob was cool to ride with. <laughs> the rest of them, they had no clue what was going on. Yeah, they, those guys didn't want to do more. The UMC guys wanted to do the same route every week. Uh, you, you try to suggest different things, and they didn't want to try it. So I like what we're riding now. It's more of a challenge. My, my numbers are better since we started riding out there in those hills. <clears throat> so, yeah, but uh, so uh, Paulie Longa has the, this Avella, the white, you all saw it on the film. And uh, he's got like a compact on that. It came, in with, it came with a 3450. And where we, where we ride for the most part, I don't think I see him using a small chain very much. I think he just uses the 50. Most of the time, because, you know, we got what, maybe four percenters. We got a few seven percenters that we come across. And it's like a what I call a sprinter's bump. It's not that long. You know, the hill itself is long, but it's one section where you hit the real steep stuff. So you really don't need to get in the very baby stuff. You can stand, get over those what I call sprinter's bumps. But uh, I like the terrain we ride in because there was a gentleman, I think it was As. Abs, Absborn that said that Asborn said I think he has a pizza cutter on his bike, meaning that the rear the rear cluster has a you know probably a 32 or 34 or something like that. And you know, he rides 17% hills or whatever. So he has the appropriate gear. So the way you want to look at it is this: 
if you lived in an area that had, say, 17% climbs, there's no way you're going to ride that every day. That's not a whole lot of fun. You could ride it in, say, Zoom 2 if you're, if, you're, if you're doing like a 34, 32, or 34, 34, something like that. You could still be in Zoom 2, maybe climbing for most of the way and until you get to the steepest pitches or whatever. But when you think about it, every hill has a valley. Uh, every mountain has a valley. So you pick your days where you're going to ride the climbs and then days where you look for something flatter so you can work on a different kind of riding, like, you know, high speed cadence or whatever you want to do. But after a while, you get bored of that. Nobody, I, I don't want to climb for an hour one way. I, you know, we used to do that. That's not a whole lot of fun. So you don't want to do that every day. So when you when you hear about it, the thing is, is that when we go where we go, we get all of it. So we'll get pitches where it'll go up to like, it'll start two, three, four, seven. Then it goes five, three, then six, you know, certain areas. But most of the time, like I go to Cimarron, there's one section where it goes from two to five, goes back to 1.5, then goes from two to five again. I really like that stretch. It ends up being like a four minute effort where you're just climbing. And it's gradual and, and it's so much easier to get like say threshold work done in that situation than when you're dealing with a 17 percenter because a 17 percenter, if you ride it hard, it's hard to control what zone you're in because you, you know you're 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 gonna be working really hard. So I don't envy him. But plus, but but the, the plus is he has the gear he needs for where he lives. That's why he referred to the, the his thing as a pizza cutter. You have to get the gear for where you live. Out here where we live, uh, I think Mo has an 11, I think he said 1123, something like that. He's got a tight cluster. And so when I, the reason I'm bringing that up is when I mentioned in the video that Mo was in the small chain ring, he's got a 30, I think a 36 or, yeah, I think he said 36. I said he was in the small chain ring and he was in a 13. Wesley Steven, one of our super legends, sent me an email saying that, isn't that a bad angle for the chain? But what Wesley missed out, I haven't replied yet, I just saw it, you know. What Wesley missed out was, it's not the, 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 the size of the teeth that makes it an extreme angle. It's where that cog is positioned. So since Moore has an 11, he was two cogs over from where you'd be cross-chaining. So the 13, you got 11, 12, 13. And that's why I estimated that he was writing a 13 because he'd already told me he has an 11. So I figured it was 11, 12, 13. And he was in, he was like two cogs over from there. He's very conscious. He, he's not going to go all the way over. And if he did, it's not the end of the, the world. If you're not in there too long, it's not that big a deal on that side. You know, even when you go the other way, what I said, if you're just there for a short period of time, at the end of the world. Every now and then I'll get on that. But I don't really like it. I don't think it's very efficient and it's hard on the components. It's not any harder because what I do is that when I, once I get to where I'm before my cross chain gear, I go down about two to three cars. Just go click, 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 then drop the front. And my, my Campagnolo, the way they designed it, when you drop from the big to the front, it has two positions. It is designed to only go down in the first position. So you're not going to drop the chain with the campy that I'm using, the super record. I think record has it also. Out of, out of the box, they set it up to where when you when you go from the, the big chain ring to the small chain ring, they drop it to where the, 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 the cage is close to the chain. And if you want to space it, then you push it another time. So it's very hard to drop a chain on the Campagnolo that I'm using when, when it's adjusted correctly. I think it's the same thing with a lot of the bikes. If you notice a lot of the pros, when they have a crash, the chain falls off. It's not because of the adjustment. It's because the bike falls and the chain bounces off the chain ring. That's why they're always trying to get their chain back on there. And that would happen to anybody if you fell. So, so just keep that in mind. So the, 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 the thing is, is that when you're riding and you're about to cross chain, just go down at a minimum of two clicks. One, two, then drop it. And you're not gonna you're not gonna spin out because you're doing it so quickly. You're just going go one, two in the back first, so you don't spin like a hamster. One, two, then go down. 
It will be close to the cadence you are doing. Then you can decide whether you continue to go down or stay there or go up. That's how you do that. I have a video that talks about that. Those of you who've been here, you know, it's in there. You can search on it, how to shift from small to big chain ring. The reason I'm mentioning that, a lot of riders hesitate to do that because there's a they, they think they're going to drop the chain or it's going to take too long because they have not practiced that. You got to practice that when you train by yourself. Practice that. So when I come to a climb, I'm in a big chain ring, I go around a corner. Where we ride, you come around a corner, sometimes the corner is a grade. There's a place called uh, Branch Crossing when we're going on the backside of the YMCA to Ash Lane. As you turn, there's a fire station. When you turn, the turn is 3% and you've been descending. So you descend and you turn and the turn itself is 3%. So that means you have to already be in the gear you need as you enter that turn. Otherwise, you're like, you know, it's not a whole lot of fun. You know? And even if that happens, just go ahead and shift. Just hesitate because you still got a, a slight momentum. But always try to shift early. Just like when you're in a car, those of you who drive a stick shift. You approach a corner, you're trained to brake, clutch, go to second gear, and accelerate out of the corner. Same thing with the bike. Get you get prepared. Like I that's why I took the time to explain in the ride Saturday when I was behind Mo. I was already in the gear I needed for that corner. And all I did was lift my inside pedal because I don't want to hit it. Uh, I don't know if that's what caused Thomas's crash, but I was watching the last stage of the tour. Thomas fell, and they couldn't discern whether he had hit a wheel because all of a sudden his wheel just turned this way. It was kind of funny because he was with his teammates, and he fell. So I don't know if his pedal hit the ground or whatever. But when you're cornering, don't get cute. Put that pedal up. Doesn't matter whether you're riding 165. Just get in the habit of putting the inside pedal up so you can really lean the bike and not have to take the chance of nicking the pedal, you know. Or if you're riding too close to the curb, you can hit your pedal. So don't ride too close to the curb. All those little things can throw off. Anything that destabilizes your bike can cause you to fall. Same thing with a car. If you're driving at a good speed and you just, let's say, downshift real rough, a lot of people who are serious about driving that when I was taught, they would always tell you, do everything smoothly. Don't don't create a, a, an imbalance in the, the way the car behaves. That's when you, you have problems. Just being rough, you need to be smooth. You, know, you slow down and so forth. So anything that will cause your bike to be unstable can cause you to fall. Same thing when that, on that video when we hit wheels. My bike went like an S. You know, when I touched that guy's wheel, my rear tire moved. I kind of expected it, but there was, I just, I just, my hands were on there and I just steered. That's all you can do. Just go with, go with what it does and come back. I don't know if those of you who are watching the tour on yesterday's sprint, there was a guy leading out Viviani and he went really hard and he just stopped and moved to the left. I mean, he almost got in the way of uh, that, uh, 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 the, the Australian sprinter. Ewan, I think his name is. He was coming from behind and he came with a blast of speed. And that guy that was pulling off was in the way. But if you notice, he was slingshotting very close to everybody. He didn't go way out and waste energy. He used slingshotting as he came by. He just, he ended up winning the fastest guy won the sprint yesterday on that day. You know, he's not the fastest guy for the whole tour, but on that day, because all those riders are doing different things. Sagan doing a lot of climbing so he can consolidate his points. And sometimes the legs are not there, but he still came in fourth, you know. So just keep that in mind as you ride. You've got to think about everything. That's the point I'm trying to make. You can't be wandering in your mind. You need to focus on the ride, what you're doing that day. You need to think about it. Everything, everything I narrate is what's going on in my head when I'm riding. All I think about when I'm riding is riding. When I, in fact, when I start my ride, I put my phone on Do Not Disturb. I don't even let it doesn't ring because that's all I want to do. Because there's too much going on for you to be distracted. That's when you can have problems. It doesn't take my. I don't care how long you've been riding. You can fall at any time. It's not the end of the world. I don't like to fall, so that's why I pay attention. <laughs> you know, it's not a whole lot of fun leaving skin all over the road. So, so keep that in mind as you ride. Mm -hmm. Paul Decker says, just got to work. Welcome, Paul. 
have a lot of Pauls down here. So Asborn says he's constantly tweaking his position as he gets fitter and more flexible. Uh yeah, I mean, I don't I don't I don't mess with my position. I mean, it's it's just there, I guess. But um if you're tweaking it, what it means is you weren't there before. That that's really what it means. Now, for example, if I were to gain a lot of weight, my position would not change. What would happen is I may not be able to go down as low if I've had a big belly or whatever, but I would still sit on the bike in the same position. So the fact that you're still tweaking tells me you're still not optimal because you say you're doing it yourself. And yet that is not unusual. There are a lot of riders that spend, riders that spend decades tweaking their position. I'm not talking about people who are on a team and have a fitter to help them. When you have somebody to, that, that's, that's experienced to look at your position, they can ask you a question and get you there faster than you who are tweaking. Because like early on in the channel, a guy named Ron Rahel and other people from Canada, one of them asked, said that, you know, I'm moving my cleats. How, when I move it back, what happens to the shoe? So if you don't know which direction your changes impact your componentry or your accessories. That's why you're constantly tweeting, tweaking because you might go in the wrong direction and move the shoe somewhere where your foot doesn't like it. Then what will happen is this hand starts getting numb, but you think it's the bars. But it's probably because that foot is unhappy, so you put weight on this hand to unload this foot. It's usually the other side. If the left foot got a problem, the right hand will go numb because you end up putting weight on the right to, to to alleviate the left foot. But if you have an, ex an experienced fitter, or you know, like all the teams have a fitter, they can look at you and then you get you tell them what you're having problems with, and they'll get you there faster than you spending years doing it. It's because it really is trial and error when you're not sure where you're going. And, and because it's kind of like you you know where you'd like to be, but you're not sure what it takes to get there. Sometimes you can be uncomfortable on the saddle, and all you need is to move the nose. A little bit over but then you end up messing with the cleat and doing other things to try to get there so you, you you are adjusting the wrong things you know because you're not really sure what's gonna get you there that's why you, a lot that's why the pros and the people who race you know on a team they're ahead of the gate they're ahead of the curve because they have help so they get there quicker you know and, it, and then every ride, and they have a ride every week where they just go and check the position, meaning you just go and you spin, you listen to your shoe. How does my foot feel in there? How does the saddle feel? Because if your foot's not right, it will pull you out of where you want to sit on the saddle. So you should have a ride where you, you dedicate that after you make the changes, but your changes need to be minute and they need to be correct to get to solve the problem you're trying to correct. That's the biggest thing. So just be sure before you make changes. Don't just change for change sake. Be, be careful what changes you make. So Enzo is here. Welcome. He says, uh, Eldred, what in your opinion is more accurate, my Garmin watch with cadence and speed sensors or Strava? <laughs> your Garmin watch. Strava, Strava calculates. They have their own algorithm and uh, I know for a fact that power numbers are wrong, you know, but I don't pay attention to that. Yeah, your, uh, your your head unit is more accurate. Strava is doing his own calculation. They're not materially off as far as the other calculations, but the power's off. If, if you could estimate power like that, power meters will be obsolete. You need a power meter to give you power numbers. So that's stuff that they calculate and they, they display as power. That's, that's off. Because I'll do a ride where I know we're putting out some watts. And it's, oh, the power was 114 watts. I'm like, please. I do 114 watts <laughs> rolling out the driveway. <laughs> so, no. I don't know about your watch, but uh, I do my stuff with the belt and my Garmin hand unit. I don't know about the watch. I don't know about the accuracy of the watch. Yeah, you say Garmin reads 17.3 and Strava 16. Strava is calculating. So, you, I, yeah, your Garmin numbers... Uh, but 
aren't you loading the numbers on Strava? Because I load my numbers directly from the head unit. The only thing they calculate is what I don't load, like power. And they, they show a power thing on there. So, yeah. If you're loading yours, it should reflect yours. It shouldn't be calculating your... It looks like average speed. <clears throat> I use Strava. I got on Strava because of the Rafa Festive 500. That's it. All I use it for is I load the group rides. That's it. I was doing. I have my data here on Golden Cheetah. I do my own analysis here. I don't need Strava for that. Um, you said they're offering a trek challenge. I accomplished riding enough for a T-shirt. You want to accomplish 500 miles to be entered into a bike drawing? Yeah. I've actually won a bike before. <laughs> so, yeah, those things work. Sometimes you get lucky. I did a review. That's how I got the call, Nago. Did a review and won that. I think Paul Ilonga um, won his, uh, I think the Giant. It was, yeah, I think it was the Giant. Yeah. So, yeah. if you, Yeah. Some of those things, sometimes they work. But for the most part, most of the time you enter, you don't hear from them. But uh, you should be you should be uploading your stuff. It shouldn't be calculating your average speed if you're uploading your data. My stuff goes to Garmin Connect, and Garmin Connect sends the stuff to Strava. That's the way I set it up. And Garmin Connect has like an app, the Strava app on the, that you enable and say, I want you to talk to Strava. That's how I did it. And once I'd set it up, I don't really do anything else with it. I don't go there to look at logs and all that stuff because I have my data locally on my Golden Cheetah software. I've never used Training Peaks. Psycho Warrior is asking what I prefer, Golden Cheetah over Training Peaks. I've never used Training Peaks. Um, the Golden Cheetah is free. I don't believe in spending money for things on a monthly basis that I don't have to because... Uh, how can I put it? I think I've said it before. I don't like how the, how you put it, the economy in the U.S., everything's tied to monthly payments. I mean, why? Why do I need to pay somebody monthly to look at data I have? It's my data. So that that's the thing. So I don't know if, I think training peaks, you have to sign up and all of that. I don't have any use for that. But if you already have an account there and you can use some of the tools, that's fine. They're just showing you the data you already have in different ways. What, what do I look at in my data? For the most part, I look at my average cadence for the ride. Of course, the duration, you kind of know. I look at my average cadence, and then I look at the, the heart rate, the ranges for the most part. I like to look at the profile of the course, where the steepest parts were, what kind of heart rate was I hitting on the 7% climb in the forest and something like that. Those, those are the little things I look at. I don't spend much time analyzing unless I have problems. Let's say I had a bad ride, didn't make any sense. I'm going to come back and, okay, what, what was going on here? What was my heart rate here? That's the kind of stuff I look at. But when you think about it, I mean, what else is there to do with the data? You know, if you have a power meter, what you could look at, if you have a power meter and heart rate, what I would use that for is to say, at 150 beats per minute, what power was I putting out? Out. That's good. That's like a, a thing you, as a range, you're memorializing. You say, okay, you train for a period of time. You say, okay, 150 beats per minute, what power am I putting out? But now the assumption is that the heart rate variable, you know, variability was not a factor per se. That's why you see the pros are still wearing heart rate belts, even though they have power meters, because they look at those things to make sure that am I improving? Am I putting out more or the same watts in this zone? So I use 150, but don't use an exact number. Use a, use a zone, use a range. In zone one, what's my average power this month? And you train for a period of time. Okay, what's my average power in zone one now? That's a good way to gauge your improvement or lack thereof. And that's why I've always felt like I think power meter and heart rate monitor should be used together. 
So it was it was nice to see most of the pros are using both because that makes sense. My internals, you know, my my heart, my lung, whatever, you know, the respiration, moving blood. What what is it doing when I put out this wattage? And then you train for a while, and theoretically now you should be able to put out more power in that same zone. Even if you didn't have those two gadgets, that's really what training does. Think about it. You could be riding, you know, sometimes it's hard if you're doing it by feel. I'll be riding in Zoom 2 by feel, and we'll be riding with certain guys, and then Paul would say, keep going. And I would tell him later, well, I was just doing Zoom 2. But I know those guys were struggling. I don't know what they've been doing. But I would let him know we weren't going that hard. We're doing our Zoom 2. That's what it's about because you get to realize, oh, wow, I'm still doing zone two, but I'm going faster. Or I'm putting out more power on this climb in this little zone. That's what I mean when I say you don't have to kill yourself on every climb. You just need to ride the climb because after a while of consistent training, you will put out more watts in whatever zone you're in if you've done the work. That's how the body improves, you know. So don't don't get too much into, you know, I'm going to study all these little metrics because, you know, some of those things like training peaks, the engineers sit around and come up with all kinds of different things. Like now they got different cycling dynamics, things that would measure one leg power and, you know, the right versus left and all of that. Some of the things they come up with, there's no real world application necessarily. It, be, it may be useful later, but you, you have to think about what am I going to use that for? So if you have a power meter, I think the best use of a power meter is to say, you know what? I only want to go 120 watts today. And some people have like things that will let them set alarms. Like my Garmin, you can set alarms with a power meter. So I only want to go 120 so you make sure you rest. Because by resting enough, when it's time to go hard, you will be ready to go. Your body will be recuperated. You know, to make sure I use the same, I use the heart rate for the same thing. I use heart rate monitor and say, I'm not going to go above 140 beats per minute. Today is easy. I rode this morning. I had an appointment in the city and I rode this morning. It was so nice. It was like 68 degrees. So I rode for an hour and a half and I, I just told myself, I'm not going to exceed 140 beats per minute. I don't sit there and look at the thing. I just go ahead and keep the gears light and just keep my cadence. I can tell if I'm pushing or not. And that's that's how you do it. So you still ride. You get a benefit. And these are the rides that you could tweak a new shoe or if you put a clean on, check it out, make your final decision on the road. That's what I use that for. You don't want to go to a group where I have problems with your cleat. You can hurt your knee or other things like that. That's what you use that for. So um, if you're using tr training peaks and it's working for you, stay with that. I use the Golden Cheetah software. It's not the easiest thing to use, but it's not the most difficult. It's free. I've used it for years, and it, it works for what I need. I just go in there and look at the, the different effort zones. You know, they give you a heart rate graph. If you have a power meter, they'll, they'll put that in there as well. They give you your your your, your, your suggested uh, what they call threshold power. If you're using power meter, they call it a CP. So what's nice about that software, if you use power meter, you, you ride for a while. Gold, uh, Golden Cheetah will say this is what your one hour maintainable power is, which is your FTP. They call it CP. It calculates it based on graphing all the history of the rides you've done. And it's usually pretty close. You know, I like to just do a threshold test periodically to make sure, you know, for the most part. But but that's the use of these gadgets. When you get them, you use them to get your zones and you kneel them down. You, you don't have to use them on every ride. And the people who are using power meters effectively, they use them on rides that matter. Like they're going to go do a time trial or a big race. Then they're going to say, you know what, I'm going to hook it up. But really, a lot of times they'll glance from time to time. The rest of the time, they're just riding. Even the pros, they're not riding looking at that number. They'll ride and maybe they start feeling bad or whatever. Then they'll say, hmm, what power am I putting out that's giving me trouble? They'll glance and it, it, it's amazing you will remember it. And they ride and start feeling great or they're breaking away. Like, oh, what power was I holding? Like Thibaut Pinot when he won on the, the Tomale. I can guarantee you he knew what power he was putting out when he gapped Bernal. 
when he took away after the two of them went away. Those are the kind of things you remember. So then you use that in training to try to get close to that because you can always you always go harder in a race. And that's what they use. They, they remember that and they go after the race and they analyze and they tell the coach, you know, oh, this is, this, this, these are the numbers I put out. And then sometimes in training you can't replicate that. But at least you know you can get there. It does something for you psychologically, like Psycho Warrior was saying, knowing that he can spin triple digits when the car got close to him in the traffic eye, he just revved it up. They need a shift. And that's what you need in a group ride. Gaps open, you just rev it up. And what I, the comment I made about don't, don't get excited when you stand. Like we're riding and I stood up. I shifted up and just stood. Same motion, harder gears. I knew my cadence would come down so that I wouldn't have too much of a gap the wheel in front of me. You stand up, just kind of change the way your muscles are working. A few strokes. Sometimes for us big guys, I mean, I say big, I'm 100 and what? 190 pounds, let's say, 86 kilos. When you stand on a steep climb, it seems to be easier because it's like you, you, you can put more in the pedals just, because just for a short time. Because sometimes I'll be riding and the climb comes. I find it easier to just stand, finish that short climb, then sit back down. Versus the smaller guys who will shift down and spin. I'm not saying all the time. There are times when I will shift down and spin, but a lot of the times it just feels better to stand because you know it's a short climb. You know, even on a long climb, there are certain sections you can stand and then sit, you know, and, and that, that's not, it breaks up the, the momentum. So do what feels good for your body type. Because, you know, I, I like to stand and you get your upper body into it. You put them, you know, your heart rate goes up a little, but I, it, it's better. It just, you don't strain your lower back. You don't get that little aching. It just feels good. That's what I was doing on a uh, Saturday. That road started going up and I just stood up. It just felt natural. Then I sat when I wanted to. And then when we got near Leah Drive, it started to power. I just stayed seated and powered the same gear. You know, there are times that you got to push. And it was, it was one of those times. So, yeah. So you have to be thinking when you're riding. You can't just be, we're not sightseeing all the time. Unless it's an easy ride or we're taking it easy at that point. So let's see. Enzo says, my watch sends my riding info to Garmin Connect. So I'm going to stick with what Garmin Connect calculates. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I don't know what Strava is doing because I, I, I do the same thing like you, Enzo. My information goes to Garmin Connect. Some of the guys that I coach, when they sign up, if they're on Garmin Connect, we join, we connect as friends so I can see some of their workouts. So I do everything in Garmin Connect because that's where I used to do our routes and I would download to my head unit. You know, I create routes and so forth. And then once I started using Strava because of the Rafa Festive 500, Garmin Connect has a, a link. And all I did was enable that link. So Garmin Connect is controlling what Strava gets. I don't send anything directly to Strava. Everything goes to Garmin, Garmin Connect as private. Then it goes over to Strava. So I don't have to do anything extra. Everything I, I manage everything in Garmin Connect. And I think, you know, it's just they have enough stuff in there to mess with. But, yeah, I don't know why they're calculating something differently. But Strava, uh, I've tried to use their help. Like, you know, you send a message. There's a lot of things. I don't know if you guys have ever tried searching on Strava. Their search is terrible. I don't know what they're doing. You can't find anything. You've got to scroll through a list of followers to find anybody. You can't just search for a follower's name. I mean, this day and age. <laughs> you know? So they are not investing in that platform. It's not very user-friendly. I've got uh, almost 600 people following me. When I'm trying to find somebody, I've got to scroll through and use an arrow at the bottom to alphabetically look at the list to find somebody. And the alphabet alphabetization is like, I think they use the first name. They've got like, you know, they're doing first name, not last name. So it's really weird. It's hard to find stuff. So as a result, I don't use the platform much. <laughs> so there's a guy here called Cheerio Bye Bye. Cool name. He says, I'm 200 pounds and just started out cycling. That's good. You're about, I think Jerry's like 210. Jerry, the guy we ride with, that's a good weight. You know, a lot of riders, yeah. 
and I can't find my spot on the bike. <laughs> Welcome. I'm not laughing at you. We all been there. I <laughs> tried many different saddles and started out with a bike fit. When I started, I don't have any pain elsewhere. Well, you have pain where it matters. Um, how can I explain it? When you, if if you can't, when you say you can't find your spot on the bike, I know what you're talking about. What I call the sweet spot. If you can't find that spot, what will happen is you're not going to put enough weight on the saddle to unload your hands because your hands now are going to be trying to use weight to, to move you around. So instead of you pedaling, you're you're looking for your spot. And then let's say maybe five minutes out of a ride, you find that spot and you don't want to move. <laughs> you don't want to get up. We talk about that. We laugh all the time. So um, you you need a fit. I don't know if it's necessary necessarily the saddle per se, but yeah, the saddle is important because everybody's anatomy is different. So guys like you that have the problem, what I would recommend is you start with this saddle, the saddle I use. They engineered it. It fits most people really well. It kind of looks weird, but it works. That's that's what I use. It's called the SMP. Dynamic. I'm trying to find the link here for you, um, because what happens is when I, how I got into it was I Steve Hogg is the fitter in Australia. I was looking for something more comfortable because I always used the like the flight Italia saddles, the lightweight stuff, and I'm a big guy. After a while, they 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 don't hold up. They were breaking and different things. I needed something sturdy. So this saddle is not the lightest saddle. It's not the heaviest, but it's sturdy. And it's the first saddle I've owned that broke on me, and I still rode for hours and was unaware. So I am sold. Uh, let's see here. Shop recommended products. Start with this SMP saddle, and then I don't know. You you need a fit, okay? Because I don't know who's been trying to fit you. That's the first thing that's supposed to address. If you can't comfortably sit on the saddle on weight, like li literally lift your feet off the pedals while seated on the saddle. Like the last ride I did, I put my hand behind me and say, if you can't do this, something wrong with your fit. That's what I mean. Your weight, you should, that saddle should be so comfortable that you don't mind putting all your weight on it. Then you know you've arrived at height and fore aft. I cannot stress that enough. And the reason I'm passionate about it is you can ask Paulie Long, I will be riding and I will just turn my head to him and say, man, I feel sorry for those who don't experience what we feel on this bike. The bike just feels comfortable. The more we ride, the better our bike feels. Because you know how it is when you start initially, the shorts hasn't moved up all the way and all that. As the ride progresses, our, our bike just feels better and better and better. We always talk about it. We kind of laugh and I say like, man. So I feel for those when you, you, you could not have said it any better. I know exactly what you're going through. So let me put this here. Let's see here. Uh, saddles, I think I called it. Yep, there we go. So here's the link. That's what you want. You want the SMP dynamic. It fits most people regardless of your hip size. 200 pounds is not heavy. A lot of riders heavier than that. Uh, the guy we ride with, Jerry Legner, is around that weight. And he's one of the fastest guys in the area. Okay, so don't when you say and the reason I'm saying that the way you started out with 200 pounds. No, you're not uncomfortable because you're 200 pounds. You're uncomfortable because you, you're out of riding saddles that too flimsy. You know, it, it's giving on you after you set it up. And then the next thing I'm going to do, what I recommend is going to be your call, because either you want to spend years doing this or you want to get the right kind of help. Uh, I'm going to put the link for our internet fit. If you're somebody who can remove bolts and whatever, we do it online, video conference, and we can get you set up because uh, it starts with that. If you're not comfortable, you're not going to be putting hours on the bike. That's why the model I said all begins with fit because, man, when I used to race, I was fiddling with my saddle all the time because my coach didn't know anything about fit. And I pay for fit kid and all kinds of crap. That's how I got into it. So 
I'm kind of glad it happened. But uh, so when you, you, this is something you should consider. That's what you need because by setting you up and you understand how your body interacts with the bike, you will look forward to every ride you do. And it doesn't matter what kind of shorts, whether it's expensive, inexpensive, whatever, it will all feel comfortable within reason. You're about one hour short and want to ride seven hours. You know, it's not going to. Um, let's see here. So, yeah, he said he had uh, problems with. Let me show you. Yeah, hit it with lower back. Yeah. Um, now, the thing with lower back, it's not just the fit. Uh, lower, my lower back will hurt if I don't do core work. And that's the reason why when we ride, you'll stand to kind of stretch your back while you're riding. You change that position because when you ride the bike and you're pulling the pedals, it's like you're lifting weights with your feet, let's say per se. You're using the muscles in your back. So if you don't strengthen the stomach muscles and they're weaker than your back muscles that get stronger from cycling, then you feel an achiness there because your core is not strong enough to counterbalance those big muscles you're growing back there. Because when you cycle, you're using the muscles in your back. There are muscles running from your lower back all the way up. You use that. That's what people try to rock when they're on the bike, when they're pushing really hard. They're trying to, you know, get more power. So, yeah, but uh, you're, you're not alone. Uh, fit is often overlooked, unfortunately, and a lot of people assume everyone else is uncomfortable, but that is not the case. If you watch experienced riders, you would see that their torso looks like it's just limp when they're riding. And the harder they ride, the more the torso gets limper because you don't use this much. You want to save energy because if you're clenching or whatever, it takes energy to do that. So as, as you ride harder, you relax. The only way you can do that is if you can transfer the weight to your rear and your feet. And the only way you will do that comfortably is if that saddle, if that saddle doesn't feel good, you're not going to be putting weight on it. And then, you know, start using your hands to offload. So, yeah. And then all of that hurts your efficiency. So you use more energy and it's just harder to go fast. And that's why some people can't keep up. They don't get faster because they're not looking for the next ride. And they get home, get in the shower. Everything burns when the water hits those areas that have been rubbing. So, yeah. So don't overlook that. All right. Let's see. El Chikungul. That's a cool name. I've seen him before. He's been here. I mean, do you want to set things up to be putting your weight almost all on your saddle when relaxed, or you want to be unloading on your handlebars too? Very good question. So you don't have to worry about unloading. If you if you saw the last ride where I did, I've done this before in, a, in an actual fit video where I put my hand behind my bike while I was riding. Saturday's ride in the warm up, I did it again. When the weight is distributed on the saddle, it's on your saddle and your feet. It's not just the saddle. But the reason why I'm stressing the saddle was to answer his question. Because if you can't put enough weight on your rear, your feet can't carry all of it. You will be off. That's your, your balance is between your feet and your rear. So to answer your specific question, you want the weight on your rear and your feet. And the only way to do that comfortably is to get that saddle set. Correct height for aft, so you're balanced and sitting in the saddle. Then you have, once you have that accomplished, there's no weight on the bars. You should never have weight on the bars. If you have weight on the bars, your steering is like this, like a squirrel, twitchy. There are riders that you may see with twitchiness, that's because they got too much weight on the bars. They can't hold a straight line. You should not have any weight on your bars. You should be able to ride with no weight on the bars. And I showed that in a video on Saturday in the warm up, the ride. If you didn't see it, just catch, catch the ride. You know, so it's often overlooked. People think you have weight. No, you're just guiding the bars. That's why you can see, you see these guys when they go through the feed zone, they'll grab a bottle or grab a musette and they're still riding and they're fishing for stuff. And some of them will keep one hand on the bar because they're close to other riders. But generally, you should have no weight on the handlebars. Your hands should just be relaxed to steer. Just like when you're in your car. Think about it. You're not grabbing that steering death grip. You're just resting on it. And some, you know, think about it. Most people got their hand on the window. You know, if you got a good alignment, you know, 
But if your alarm is off, then you got to hold that bad boy because it's pulling one way or the other. So that's the way to look at it. So if you got weight on the bars, then your alarm is off on the, on the back, on the bike, just like the car. That's a good, good analogy there. So I hope that clears it up for you. You need a good fit. And if you're not there, get help. Otherwise, you would take 20 years. You're still messing around because you don't know what direction you're going in. You don't know what corrections will get you there. You talk to somebody who knows what they're doing. Based on what you say, I can tell you exactly what to do to correct the problem and get you in the right direction. That's the key. All right. He said, a Cherry Obaba says he tried specialized power and physique and teres. They are kind of okay, but not over time. Yeah, I didn't do physique and teres. I did the arione. Because I'm very flexible, they, they refer to my flexibility as snake, and so they said. But the, the Ariane was okay. Yeah, it's funny you, you said that. But the SMP, I don't know what they did with that, and I'm glad I tried the dynamic because SMP has many shapes and sizes of saddles. But I did. We did not have a store in Houston that carried the, the, the loaners that you could test. So I didn't want to take the, the chance of spending money on a saddle and being stuck with it. It didn't work for me. So I chose the dynamic because it's the one shape of all the forms that they make that fit most people, regardless of your hip size. When you go to their site and you read it, that's exactly what they say. And so, and I'm glad I went with that. So yeah, this saddle is complete. It's different. There are a lot of riders that use it. Um, and I, I'm just sold on it. I've used physique. I've used the ramen, ramen saddle. It was okay, like, like you said. And once I got to this saddle, that was it. You know? <laughs> like I said, yeah, I'm a ride. And I liked it so much, I got three of them, on one on each of my bikes. And once you find a saddle that works for you, stay with it. You get another bike, get the same saddle, put it on there. Because the shape, if the shape works for you, then you're good. In fact, my plan is to get a spare because some of these guys, you get a saddle you like, then they change the, the shape. So, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to stress that you, you open up with the weight. 200 pounds is not big. You know, there, there are riders in the tour. There's some guy's like 6'5". He's on one team. He's a tall guy. And he weighs a lot more than that. So, no. If you're a big guy like you, me, we need a sturdy saddle, not those flimsy, lightweight things because they move under you. You need something supportive. This saddle is reasonably weighted, 239 grams, something like that. I never weighed it, but you'll see the weight when you shop for it. Uh, it's it's not any, It's you're not going to notice. It's not clunky. It's a good saddle. It's, you know, th this company, uh, apparently SMP has studied the human body, the shapes and different things. In fact, their saddles, the, the dynamic, the one for women is the same saddle. They just use pink and other colors that they think ladies like. Because the human hip, what we sit on, is similar down there. So they don't make a different shape for women. You know, and I, I just I just it just works. So that's what I recommend to everyone when people ask what saddle you recommend. Yeah, he said it looks kind of strange. Oh, it's more common than you know, but it's common among people in the know, like you have become. Remember, I remember what I said. I, I couldn't find a bike shop. Houston is the fourth largest city in these United States. And I couldn't find a bike shop that carried that saddle. So it seemed like, hmm, is it really that weird? No, you go online, it's everywhere, eBay, whatever, you know. So it's just, it's not mainstream, but I think it should be. But people who are having problems or want to ride more and they start finding out, oh, wow. Yeah, th that dip that you see when you get it, it's still set level. But that dip relieves the pressure on your perineum, the soft tissue between your anus and your privates. You should not be sitting on that. The hip bones, if you, if you reach back, there's a bone, there are two bones. That's what you sit on and you're perched on that. So a lot of people don't even sit properly on the saddle. When you sit properly, that's why the, the, the shorts, the top shorts, the pads are in, almost like inside the leg. You know, they're, they're not behind. You don't sit back there. It's inside the leg. If you look at it, you know, and in the middle, they have a split. 
So I'm going to have separate pads on each side. So you're at the point where now you have become a cyclist. The people on this channel are cyclists. They're not people that just ride bikes. And I'm not saying that to be an elitist. That is just the reality of it. A lot of people ride bikes. They're not cyclists. Cyclists are students of the sport. So forget about looks. Feel is more important. <laughs> and those who've been here, they know what I'm talking about. So don't worry about how it looks. It works. And it doesn't mean it's the only saddle that can be comfortable, but it just minimizes your search. I can ride other saddles, but this one's just so much better. And uh, what's it in that? I think it's in this ride where I talked about the commentary. Saturday, we're talking about it. And Jerry said, because I was I mentioned to Jerry, I said, I don't move on my saddle. You know, and I noticed some of the guys in the tour will be riding and they'll scoop back or like Garrett Thomas will be sitting on the tip of his saddle. When I see him, I'm like, man, I can't be comfortable. It, it seems to work for him. And so we're talking about it. And Jerry said, Jerry Legner said, oh, you know, you, you change the way you use your muscles when you move forward. He said, I like to sit on the back when I'm climbing. And then I tip, I get to the tip when I'm on the flats. That's what he said. So what I told him was, because I always have an open mind. I don't profess to know it all. You can learn something new until the day you die. I believe that. So what I told him was, I said, well, for me, and, and, I, and then I qualified, I said, maybe it's the kind of saddle I use. Well, you said I look funny, a little dip. What I told him was, I don't, I don't move at all. I have no need to move. But what I do notice is that when I get into drops, my hips roll. And that's everybody. When you get in the drops, your hips roll because your hips are like this underneath where you sit on. And so they roll into the saddle towards the front. So what I told him, when I get in the drops, my hip roll. So I feel like I'm more in the saddle. And I showed him while we're discussing it. I pedaled forward and I said, look, you can see my saddle more now. I was in the drop. And then he, he nodded his head. So what happens is I believe that if you set your saddle correctly, you should not need to be scooting around because it's inefficient. Now, I know for a fact that the time trial riders in the tour, they're limited by restrictions of the UCI that limit how, where they can put the saddle. That's why they're getting these chopped off the saddle with a short front and so forth. So a lot of them are not sitting where they would like to sit because that would break the UCI rule. But on the road bikes, they don't have that limitation. I looked at uh, Sagan, and I always look at the guys who are winning. They don't move around. It's always these guys that are, you know, trying to get in the breakaway or whatever. You look at Thomas DeGant. All these guys that are always, they're just, they're just there. So that's the way you want to look at it. Not all the pros are there yet. Some of these guys are young guys, just got a contract. So don't copy all of them. If you look at the guys that are winning, their positions are pretty much... They're nailed down. You should not be scooting around. That's just, every time you move, you can't pedal. So you stop and you move. So you lose that stroke. It's inefficient. So just keep that in mind. So uh, get a saddle that fits your anatomy because your, your hip should fit in the saddle like that. You should be in there. And then at the back, my, my the back of my palm there represents the back of the saddle. You should sit in there like that. When you set it correctly, that's where you should be. You just sit, you get an aha moment, and then you, your legs are free to just spin. And then you can just you can put your hand like this and just ride. You guys see Mo, he's riding, and then he starts to eat. And he starts to spin faster as he sits up because he's using his hips to control the bike, which is what you use. That's what you use to control the bike. When you're dodging a hole, you're not using your steering. You move your hip to guide that, that bike. So those are little subtle things that most people are not aware of. You know, and that's what we cover here over here. So, yeah, don't worry about looks. Trust me. If you know what you know, you don't worry about it. If I'm walking down the street, people laugh. I know they're not laughing at me because I looked at myself before I left the house. I know who I am. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Um, so El Chikungor says that SMP, how hard is it? What do you think about hardness? Uh, I'm not going to use the word hardness. You want your saddle to be firm. The SMP has a padding, and you can feel it. You don't want your saddle to be cushy, because if it fits you well, you won't need it. 
That's why you got chamois in the shorts. So less is more on the quality saddle. All the quality saddles have very minimal padding. That's the word they use, minimal padding. You can squeeze it, gives just a tad. That's how SMP is. Yeah, if it's set correctly, you're not gonna be uncomfortable because of the padding. You're gonna be uncomfortable because of where you sit on that saddle. That's what makes you uncomfortable. If it's not under you, cradling your undersides, that's when you get uncomfortable. All right, let's see. Um, I'm beginning to think that soft saddles are kind of a trap because they cost extra rubbing. Soft, soft saddles are a mistake. They're not for serious riders. Look at the look at the tour. Look at the U.S. Pro Championship. Look at the uh, the tour of California. Look at what those guys are riding. You don't ride more than they do, so you think it's uncomfortable. Use that as a gauge. Those boys live on the bike. Soft saddles are actually uncomfortable because you, they're trying to make up for a bad fit. So initially, it may feel okay, but start logging the miles. Then you start chafing and all kinds of stuff. No, you don't need all that. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of riders that don't even like shorts that have thick padding. Some riders prefer thin padding in their shorts. When the bike fits you, I've made the comment, you can put on a pair of jeans, I mean, in, on the trainer and ride it. The only problem with regular clothes is the seams will rub on your skin. That's what you, you get discomfort from. It's just the seams. Uh, the padding, the eliminate seams, that's what that's what chamois there are no stitches in there where you sit. That's what kind of tears up your skin. So no, find a saddle that suits your anatomy. And a lot of bike shops will let you try different saddles. The SMP is not the only saddle out there. Many other saddles. You want the, the saddles that you see those guys riding, those thin looking saddles with the back, you know, generally that shape, you know, some people like a flat saddle. Some people like a saddle with a bit of a dip. A lot of the riders now, all their saddles have a split in the middle, whether it's flat or not. Once you identify what works for you, then you stay with it. But that process limits you to the local bike shop and what they carry. So you can do that, go that route, but go there and get the loaners. Don't go spend your money until you find a saddle that will work for you. All right. So Cherio Babai says he thinks his pelvis is sticking a little outwards, so that can be a factor of why it hurts. Start with a saddle that sits, that fits your undercarriage. Whether your pel, your, your, whether it sticks outward or not, you don't, you're not sitting there. You're sitting underneath, in the cup of the saddle, like I displayed. Start with a saddle that feels good under you. Just make sure you're sitting properly in the saddle. And make sure the height is correct. Because if the height is wrong, you will never be comfortable. It will put too much pressure on you. If it's too high, too much pressure. If it's too low, pressure on your knees and stuff. So height and four aft, critical, then feet. That's why I tell everybody, get a fit. It, it's a science. It's not easy. The pedals are the hardest things to set. And then... The fitters out there that you know they sell, they, they fit, and then some of them, some of the stories I hear, they don't ask questions and stuff they don't do. I don't try to counteract what because I wasn't there. But what I try to let people know is you got to pick your fitters carefully. Uh, El Chikungo, I did not try. Well, El Chikungo is asking what kind of Antares did I try? I didn't try Antares. I actually purchased the Arione. Oh, I guess he's. You're asking this gentleman, then you're asking Cheerio. Yeah, okay. Um, just just find a saddle that suits your anatomy before you spend money. I cannot stress that enough. It's too expensive to just be trying like that. All right. <clears throat> Tony Sweet, welcome, Tony. I haven't heard from me in a while. Tony is a, a velomobile owner. As a, he has a little, I think that you know, uh, Anthony is three now, I guess. That's a three-year-old from the time he was two. He's been watching the channel also. He's a legend. He said, Eldred, have you ever heard of inf Infinity, I guess? Or infinite? Using this, or infinite. Using this drink 
You do not drink gels or eat anything they claim. Some have gone days only using this. You can make custom mixes. Never heard of them. Let me see. Let me see. Infinite. What a heck of a name. I don't know if I want to drink for days, though. <laughs> I got to eat some solid food. Here we go. Infinite nutrition. I'm going to put the link here for, for everyone. Let's see. Get in the loop with a free bottle. Sign up our emails. You'll be the first to know about sales, special events. Count me in. How do you get a free bottle? You have to buy something? Oh, that's the bottle, not okay. Let me put the link over here for those of you who might want to check it out. Infinite sports drink. Um, let's see, not right now. Five hour challenge, free consistent preset formulas. I haven't heard of them. I'll check it out. We'll see. So let's see here. Uh, Psycho Warrior says he spent a year and a half riding without a bike fit on a gel seat because I didn't know. Yeah, that's true. They did the same thing with Paul. Paul wasn't on a gel seat, but when I met him, he had some seat. I told him, ah. And he had the other seat. We did. He had the right seat, the seat that you see the guys in the tour riding. I don't remember the model, what it was, but just, you know, racer type seat. He told them he was uncomfortable. They removed the seat, had him purchase a, a cushier seat, which ends up raising your saddle height even more. So when I met Paul, he had a lot of weight on the bars and he wasn't tracking very right on the ride. And we bumped while we were riding together. He couldn't hold a straight line. A lot of them do that. They just don't know. You know, performance in all these other places. They don't. They don't admit. They don't know. They, they should have recommended him to a, a fitter. You know. But anyway, the first thing we did was we went back to the saddle that you see all the racers riding. We set up his saddle height for af one afternoon. He could tell the difference. I mean, immediately. And that's the way it's supposed to be when it's done right. You should be immediately comfortable. Don't fall for oh, you will ride into it. Bogus. You don't ride into it. It's comfortable now <laughs> on the trainer, you know, for somebody who knows what they're doing. So let's see here. He says, because uh, I didn't know. Felt like I played in a football game after a ride. Yeah, everything hurt. Everything hurt afterwards. Yep, that's what it is. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, what happens is that when you're not fitted correctly, you use your muscles wrong, you don't relax. The muscles here get achy because you're just not, you can't, ah, you know, you can't relax. Because people ask when we started this channel, like, how you guys ride five, six hours? We ride like five hours every Saturday, whatever. Somebody said, don't you get saddle sores? I said, no. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not getting saddle sores. I wouldn't be doing it. You know, somebody asked, and it was an honest question. And this is what I said. Everyone who's uncomfortable expects that every cyclist is experiencing the same discomfort they are because they don't know. They think all of us are uncomfortable. And that's why I always mention to Paul, man, I feel sorry for those who don't have a good fit because they're missing out. You know, you, you, the hill kicks in and your fit is good. All you do is you just you wrap that you wrap it up to get over the thing. You don't have to think about it. You just go. Your body just works better. Everything just works better. I don't care what is an inexpensive bike or expensive bike. You need a fit. Without that, you're you're losing out. <laughs> Let's see here. <laughs> oh, okay. So Anthony's three. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll check out that they have a team infinite as well. A lot of the triathletes on there. So I'll check it out. See, Jeffrey Davis says my saddle is flat and hard. I don't even think about it. it feels like a cloud. I also had a gel saddle until I found the channel. Yeah, the gel saddle is trying to make up for a bad fit. You should never need a gel saddle. I don't know. I mean, it's that's why I talk about marketing, you know, the selling stuff. And that, that's my thing when I start talking about tubeless tires or disc brakes or whatever. And I don't want people to think that I'm anti-improvement or whatever. But there are a lot of things you don't need. And I've made the comment, you don't need a commercial to tell you what you need. You just go seek it out. 
you know. So a lot of stuff they're just pushing like, okay, you know, do I really have to get that? But they make it seem like you can't live without it, that you really need it. But it's not the case. Jail saddle for what? A uh, guy came for a fit and under his bar tape, he had gel. I, I didn't know they sold the gel individually. Somebody had wrapped gel over two, two layers of tape. So the thing was, not only was it thick, it was cushy because his hands hurt. Well, there was nothing wrong with the bars. His saddle was wrong. So he had weight on there. The saddle was tipped down. So he had even more weight. So they were trying to correct that with gel. I mean, it was a mess. <laughs> so I removed all that crap and the bar was naked. When we did his fit, when we finished, he's riding on the trainer with the naked bars and he's like, I can't believe it. So I said, no, I didn't put the tape back on there because I wanted you to just see that you don't need anything on the bars. The tape's there so you don't slip. That's why riders decide whether, I use leather tape because a lot of time when I ride solo in the summer, I don't wear gloves. It's just me. Group rides, yeah, I wear gloves. So with the leather, I don't have to worry about my hands slipping, you know, because it gets a little, you can get sweaty. That's all the tape is there for. You know, it's not there for comfort. The bar should be comfortable. You, you probably have heard experienced riders say, I like to feel the bar. When we buy gloves, we don't want thick gloves. I want to feel the bar. My gloves are thin. They got padding here and where they, they need it, but the rest of it, I want to feel the bar. And all they are for really is for perspiration or, you know, in the group, if you fall, you got a layer of fabric before it gets to your skin. That's the biggest thing. That, But a lot of experienced riders, when they ride solo, they don't use gloves. Just head out. I head out. I don't put on gloves in the summer. It's hot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, uh, Joseph Santo, welcome. Just got a fabric scoop saddle, the flat one. No issues at all. Almost got the cell SMP. Fabric scoop. Let's see. But that's good. But focus more on the shape of the saddle, Joseph whether it's flat or whether it has a dip or not, so you know what works for your body. Because I can just walk into a store and pick any brand of saddle, and it will work for me because I know my body prefers a saddle that has a bit of a dip in the middle. I don't do well with flat saddles. Fabric scoop. That's what matters. That way, if you have to change brands, you're not going to be guessing too much. I see. Fabric scoop. Yeah, it looks like Elite Radius Saddle. Okay, I could use the fabric scoop. It has a bit of a dip. It's like a, the old school Concord style almost. Yeah, those work. Those work. That's, I just pulled up the picture. Uh, let's see here. Ian, welcome, man. That was Ian, welcome. He said, when I first started riding, Ian Hunter, one of our big supporters, when I first started riding, I had a very soft saddle, which soon became uncomfortable. Now I could ride on a piece of glass and be comfortable. <laughs> Let's not have you do that. Um, there are riders that there are riders that will ride on just a naked carbon saddle. Uh, even S and P makes one. Many manufacturers, you know, they sell them for for more because it's carbon, carbon rails, just carbon, no padding. Some riders they'll ride on that. They're fine. Um, I probably could, but I'm like, you know what? <laughs> let me let me stick with the padding. You know, but uh, yeah, um, what he means is when you're riding and the saddle's in the right place, you, most of the time you don't have a lot of weight on the saddles. When when the road gets bumpy, I don't have to stand to unload the bike. All I do is I put my weight on the pedals while seated and it frees up the saddle. It's like your body automatically does that and then the bike bounces under you. So you know, when your fit is right, there are many ways you can unload the bike. So when you go hard, you don't have a lot of weight on the saddle. It, it transfers to the pedaling circle. So for the most part, that bike is just that, that under you. That's what you feel. Just a little touch from time to time until you sit up. So that, that, that's the thing I'm talking about. There are little, little things you notice as you improve your fit. You're like, wow, I missed out. Wow, you know, that's why I mean, aha moment. Okay, let's see.
So Jeffrey says he also has a fabric flat. Okay. Yeah, Joseph says so many saddles, you have to try them. That's why some of the shops have loaners. So if you're searching, use their loaners. They're free. They'll give them to you sometime a week. You try it until you find the one you like, then you order one. The loaners, a lot of the official loaners will come in colors that they don't sell to the public. They'll have a funky color, have the text that says loaner on it. Or some of the shops will probably just have one to use as a loaner, you know, and then you can go with but a lot of shops around here. I, I just, I didn't see anything. They, they don't even carry S&P to even have a loaner. So that was, that was the thing. So Ian says he uses the S&P saddle on his indoor spin, StarTech spin bike. I love the way the saddle scoops in the center. And the drop nose is very comfortable. Yeah, I, I love the saddles. I used to have some saddles that when I would stand and I want to sit back, they would snag my short from time to time. Not, not a problem with the S&P. You just slip back. And I set all my saddles level, zero degrees. That's what works for me. I start, most people I fit at zero degrees, unless there's some biomechanical reason for tilting out of slightly up, down. But either direction, I rarely have exceeded three degrees. Three, three degrees has been the limit. Usually, a lot of times, one. I have fitted someone who had an accident and the hip was not adjusted correctly. So they needed the saddle to be turned a little to the right instead of being over the top two. And so turned a little to the right, fell straight for that person. So that should be the only reason you make those kind of adjustments. So when everybody comes, I start them at neutral. And then watch. And then I talk to them. I make them ride hard. When you're riding a big gear and you get it up to 90 RPM, you can't cheat. I can tell if your knee's accelerating or you're bouncing or whatever. And that's how I said in the videos that the formula is just a starting point. Some people, it will work out of the box. But a lot of people, you got bigger feet or whatever. It's a starting point. And then you tweak from there. And then you get feedback. John Hill, welcome. Thank you, John. One of our longtime supporters. Thanks for the super chat. Appreciate it. So, yeah, uh, we could we could do sessions every day, live session, and talk about fit. Fit is such is fit is, is pretty close to being complicated like training. And the reason is that just like training, every human being is so unique. So find the saddle that suits your body. But the most important thing to pay attention to is ask yourself, are you sitting properly on the saddle? Are you sitting in that area where your sit bones should be about, it's about two centimeters in the scoop area. There's a two centimeter area where I put my finger and I, 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 I identify that on the website where people, a lot of people don't know where to sit. And then they say, oh, the saddle's uncomfortable. I was on a ride with a guy named Paul Meyer. He rides with us. He bought a new bike that day where we did, uh, the week that I was off, and then I did that ride just coming back after nine days. That Thursday, July 4th, we rode together. He's sitting on the back lip of the saddle. And the funny thing is, I didn't say anything. He asked me for an evaluation. He said, oh, I just got this new bike because my other bike had a problem. And I'm going to be going to Colorado and I wanted to get your assessment. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, you know, so what that told me is he knew his, his setup was off. He knew. So I told him, I said, you need a fit. You bought a new bike and didn't fit it and come on a ride. He said, you're going to Colorado. So you need a fit. I told him that you have to pay for. And he and I both laughed. I said, you know, I'm right here with them. And they don't even think. I got people driving 900 miles from Florida to come for a fit. Got people 20 minutes away. Don't want to take advantage of it. I mean, are you kidding me? Please. So he's going to keep riding in discomfort. He ain't serious. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, El Chicongo says the thing is cultural. Today we cure the symptoms, not the disease. Better business. Yeah. The point he's making is, oh my butt hurts. Yeah, I got a cushy saddle. As opposed to your butt is hurting because that saddle is too high. <laughs> or it's too far forward. Or you're sitting on the nose. You know, a lot of things are making it hurt. The saddle height can be right, but if you're not sitting in the right place, yeah. 
you know, <laughs> so he's right. So they want to cure the symptom, but the problem is the people curing the symptoms have no idea how to solve the problem. And they're posing as problem solvers. Because no problem solver would tell you to buy a cushier saddle or a gel. They got gel gloves, then gel handlebar tape. I mean, with all that gel, pretty much you wouldn't even be able to touch your bike. <laughs> and every time you add things, it affects your fit. Think about it. The saddle's full of gel, your saddle's higher. So did they adjust the height lower so you still have the same distance to the pedals? That's, you, you, that's why I say you got to be careful who you listen to, be careful where you go, do your research, and, you know, that's the key. That That's the key. Go to the right place. The same thing with medical stuff. Like, you know, he's re referring to, not all the doctors are good, you know. Hey, Tony, appreciate the super chat. I will use my wife as an example. My wife hurt her shoulder years ago. And uh, the doctor, I went there. We took her that money for the surgery. He claimed, oh, in three months, you'll be fine, please. Years later, they were still going in to remove scar tissue. You know, like, you know, so that's why a lot of people, you know, I got a back problem. They don't even want to, tell, you know, what? I will go do yoga, whatever. They don't want, because these doctors, not all of them are very good. And Tony's one of the ones that they told to just, just lay down and die. Don't do anything. Because Tony has a, a disease that affects him. And so the doctor said he shouldn't be active at all. And so Tony, because of the, the limitation of the disease, he can't ride a bike like we do. So what did he do? He got a Velomobile. The doctor didn't recommend that he do that. He wanted him to just lay in bed. Thankfully, so Tony rides a Velomobile. You know, how can you tell somebody to just lay down? That, what kind of life is that? What kind of doctor is that? You know, these guys. So, yeah, you got to do your own research. The doctors, uh, not all of them are very good. So if Tony had listened to that guy, he wouldn't be living his life. You know, the doctor made it seem like the disease has him so fragile that don't risk this. Don't don't get out the door. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. And that's why I always say fire those doctors. I don't, I'm not anti-doctor, but I'd much rather not need them. <laughs> you know, Because uh, one of them tried to get me on high blood pressure pills. I was like, no, I'll find a different solution. So Tony says, uh, check out 12 Hours Road America. I will be competing in this event. It will be, a, it will be cool to see one of your group there. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to make it there, buddy. T they are having this event to support the, your uh, team Triumph. 12 Hours Road of America. I'll check it out. Cal Cycling, could you please do a video on your explanation of tubeless tires and your thoughts? I don't know if that's going to be a good topic for this team here. I'm not sure uh, about tubeless tires. Let's see here. Um, I don't own tubeless tires, so... If you're thinking about buying tubeless tires, the best thing I would recommend is that you can add a search on Google, but all my research has indicated that they're a pain in the butt. So if you want something that's harder to change, that you need, sometimes you need like a compressor to get the tire mounted, it's a big headache. Uh, I think even GCN has a video on that. Uh, I'm not going to be adopt adopting tubeless technology anytime soon because I don't believe it's there yet for the road bike. If they want to bring something, it needs to be at least as easy to do. Uh, I've been right on a ride where there was a guy, um, it was UMC. His name was George, and he had a flat. He had tubeless, and, and he needed to put a tube in it because the, the hole, the, the cut was too big. And this guy fought so hard to get the thing off of the rim, then put a tube in there. And I'm like, if you got to carry a tube anyway, What's the point of tubeless? I don't carry a tube when I drive my car. So they're going to have to rethink that. I don't know if it's ready necessarily. Plus, it's new technology. So what do you need? You need specific rims that can hold tubeless because you can't just put it on regular rims. It, it needs a special lip to get that seal for the air. And then you have to put a sealant in there through the valve. And then sometimes it's a mess when you take it apart. So it's an all new technology. So I don't know what problem they're trying to solve. So why would I want to do something that's more difficult? 
and harder to do. So yeah, it's not something I, I would want to make a video on. It's just not practical. But GCN has a video on there, Cal. You can check there. They'll tell you how difficult it is. Simon did one a while ago. And all the all the articles about them talk about the same thing. And that's why you don't see them mainstream. They're not practical. Some people have them and they're happy with them. But uh, if you have a flat, you pretty much, you know, and I think the rims will hold regular tires too. So you could go either way. The problem is once you put that sealant in there, it's a mess when you get it off. Plus, it's hard to get on and off. Simon did one where he said you have to use soapy water or whatever. So depending on which kind you get, you may even need a compressor to mount it, like at a tire shop or something. You definitely need sturdier tools. So everything about it is more difficult. It's more expensive. So what's the upside? So I don't know. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, Ian, well explained. It's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to wrap up. Today was cool. Uh, lots of good questions. I want to thank all the supporters. John Hill, Tony Sweet, Robert Tangler, Jeffrey Davis. It's funny. Uh, all you super legends as well as super chatters, you keep the channel going and we appreciate it so much. Thank you. Be safe. Get out there. Keep getting your K's in. Have a good Wednesday evening, morning, wherever you are.